to start or can we start? Well, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this session. We are really looking forward to hear from you whether what we claimed or asked in the title of this session, you would agree or disagree with us. My name is Milica Pesic. I am executive director of Media Diversity Institute, which is London-based organization. We've been working in different parts of the world starting from Europe, European Union, and then going to different parts, including China, Cuba, Sub-Sahara. Um, as the name says, for us, uh, freedom of expression is the basis to, to start from and end to. And we see it, of course, as the right of everyone, every citizen, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, physical, mental abilities, sexual orientation, language, to have rights to express themselves, particularly through the media. So we've been quite worried about what's been happening over the last couple of years, particularly since the financial crisis in 2008 we had. Um, but I want, before I introduce my panelists, just to mention that Bruf Bruf Brufani Hotel or Palace, you probably know, is the place where actually the first successful action Mussolini ran, March to Rome. And as you probably know, Mussolini was a socialist when he started his, and he was a journalist. So there is a reason, another reason to use this festival to open discussion on, on this issue. Now I'd like to introduce uh, my panelists, and I'm definitely not going to start with a man. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with <laughs> well, I, actually I was, I was supposed to ask what was your gender. Maybe, you know, what I see as a man. Wow. It's a, there is a, what is, you know, now this, uh, what do you call it, flu, fluid gender. Um, so um, on my far right, <laughs> Bettina Fiegel, whom uh, you've read probably our CVs, but Bettina is a, is a, is a journalist and uh, online um, uh, editor for Wiener Zeitung in Vienna, in Austria. And Bettina has done several great things over the last couple of years. Um, she's done studies on uh, how tabloids and social media contributed to the rise of or to the success of certain parties in, uh, in Austria. She's done a lot of stuff related to digital journalism and uh, she will uh, be very pleased to share some of her findings uh, with us uh, today. Then uh, I have Jovanka uh, also on the right, Jovanka who is a research associate with the Institute of Social Science in Belgrade, Serbia, who's been doing media analysis for the last 25 years. And as you all know, um, Balkan had wars some 25 years ago, and uh, what's been happening in the media over the last couple of years makes us feel that media are going back where they were just before the War, Balkan Wars. And then I have on my uh, left side, Yasmin Alabai Brown, who identifies herself as a lefty liberal, anti-racist, feminist, Shia Muslim. Uh, Yasmin has been uh, writing about diversity and immigration for a very long time for different uh, media outlets. And um, Yasmin is second most hated woman on British online media, um, <laughs> which uh, did not disturb people who decided last year actually to give you an award uh, as the columnist of the year. And uh, you are the first uh, woman of color who won that award. So it's good to hear that things, there are positive things happening. And 
as we would say, last but not the least, we have Jean-Paul Martoz, who's written, I think, 15 books or so about journalism, who's committed all his life to, to journalism, who recently did a great uh, handbook for journalists on how to report on terrorism, um, and uh, who's been talking about um, committed journalism. So a very qualified, competent uh, panel. Um, and uh, I'd like to start because I came with this title of this session and even my colleagues in the in Media Diversity Institute were asking me, am I going too far? Um, well, um, one of, of historians who wrote about fascism, uh, Ernst, Ernst Nolte, in 1960s uh, talked about fascism in his book, Three, Three Kinds of Fascism, uh, that it is anti-philosophy that united people frightened by social and economic change, change anti-Semitic, anti-socialist, anti-feminist, anti-democracy, anti-diversity, of course, and then several principles he listed, hatred of democracy, the necessity of violence, biology as destiny, national identity, and politics is everything. So to me, when you look at this, this definition and then think about you know, the so-called cultists who we saw um, in Charlottesville, who are actually not afraid of being identified um, as you know, um, fascists, where Nazi swastikas, when you remember what happened in Poland last year, 60,000 people marched uh, proud to be neo-Nazis. Uh, Alt-right, alt the same kind of people. Um, and then um, rejecting everything which is different from what they are. And then we have neo-Nazis who actually genuinely believe that they are not fascists and they're probably the ones um, we're talking about in particular. So what I would say, the same way fascism before second, the Second World War and during the Second World War was not the same in all countries, so the same is today. What's happening in some countries uh, is different from, from the others. But there is a good say, saying in English language, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. So with these words, I would let my panelists uh, talk and I would like um, Bettina to, to start because they had recently, as you know, elections in, in Austria and uh, one of the parties which uh, is now in the government was actually set up, uh, uh, funded by, uh, by uh, neo-Nazis immediately after the Second World War. So Bettina, the floor is yours. Thank you. So yeah, you probably know that we have a new government since 117 days exactly in Austria. And uh, it's the first time since 17, 18 years that the far right is participating in, in the government again. And I'm, I'm sure that there are some ducks there. Um, so as you might know or might not know, um, the, the Freedom Party is uh, considered extreme right by um, one of our leading research centers on, on extremism in Austria. And uh, in, in Austria media, we usually don't refer to them as fascist or as um, often even not as extreme right. Often you read populist, right-wing populists. And in Germany, this is the only way you're allowed to say it because it would be against the constitution to say um, extreme right to the Freedom Party. Um, in Austria, it is not. Um, and the, the Freedom Party uh, has a lot of members that are in fraternities, and the fraternities have many um, things that I recall when you read out uh, the definitions of, of fascists. Um, so violence is, is part of it. Um, the male um, symbols are, are very strong. Um, the aesthetics of politics are a, a big um, issue in the fraternities, and they, they emphasize the structure of meetings, political symbols, um, and, and also dominant figures are very important to them. And 40% uh, of the Freedom Party members are also part of fraternities. So, 
personally, how would you call them? I would say far right far or right. extreme right. Okay. Thank you. Bettina, Jovanka, do you want to Thank take you. over, please? Well, answering the que this question, I will refer to the words of uh, uh, philosopher Boris Buden, who comes from the Western Balkans and now lives in Germany and knows very well uh, the local situation and the European situation. He says, we hesitate to use the word fascism, even when we should, because it is such a horrible word. Then he says, fascism of today and fascism of tomorrow is not and will not look like the fascism of yesterday that we know, fascism from the 20th century. It will be different. And lastly, he says, there is a new phenomenon in liberal democracies under global capitalism that has many undemocratic pra practices, policies, which are incompatible with uh, liberal democracy, but we accept them as democratic normality. And the problem is that we haven't given it a new name. In the Western Balkans, we now have regimes uh, which are uh, very different from other regimes uh, in, in neighborhood, let's say. And uh, uh, these regimes very recently have given a new academic name, and it is stabilitocracy. It is a new term to design regimes which uh, include uh, very harsh anti-democratic practices but are given external legitimacy by the European Union. Uh, they include many uh, pro-fascist policies and practices. This is, uh, can, you, can you put that? The first one, yeah, the first one, please. This is president of Serbia, uh, Alexander Vucic, and this is the ca caricature of, of, of him growing, uh, growing Serbia in new circumstances. Uh, they include, these practices include uh, nationalism, for example, which is a um, normal, a dominant framework uh, for looking at uh, today's world and looking at everyday's life. Uh, the populist leaders our populist leaders will not say Serbs, Croats, Albanians, uh, although they promote ethnic conflicts every day, they will say people, they will say their state, Serbia, Croatia, uh, the conflicts are there. But uh, uh, the normalization of that ethnic perspective is something very normal. Here, for example, uh, this is the extreme of using the, this ethnic perception um, uh, the largest tabloid in Serbia, Informer, when uh, Trump was elected uh, president of America, put these billboards in Belgrade uh, uh, on many streets uh, with the words, congratulations, uh, Mr. Trump, you the Serb. So everything great must be of Serbian origin, of course. Uh, so it's disdain for human rights, it's a uh, lack of free media, it's uh, uh, abolishment of parliament, uh, it's uh, fraudulent elections. So all these uh, practices are uh, performed not by some marginal social political forces, but by central authorities. And this, another specific feature is that is all of this is done under the monitoring of European Union. All these countries are in the accession process to European Union and they are the object of very uh, regular, regular, strong uh, monitoring of European Union, which every year issues these progress reports. Uh, it is the European Union that gives legitimacy to these uh, regimes, which, uh, uh, which produce all these negative practices, but deliver stability and that's the only product that they give. So I would say that this new term maybe explain th this one new phenomenon of today, which is very similar to fascism, 
In fact, all these regimes are populist regimes, and there are many uh, uh, academics who uh, compare populism with, with fascism, saying that every fascism is very deeply rooted in populism, but not every populism has to end up in fascism. It depends on many factors. Thank you, Jovanka. Jovanka just reminded me, um, there is a word which might become a word of the, of the year, like the way uh, fake news was the word of the year of 2017, nativism. Yeah, I was just going to use that. And well, that's how I wanted to introduce uh, you. Um, so Yasmin, please, how do you see nativism and um, can you relate to Britain? Well, the thing is I come at this from a slightly different position. I think um, fascism is such a strong word and we all know that and even Mr. Nigel Farage knows it's a terrible thing to be, yeah? Nobody wants to be a fascist. Nobody wants to say apartheid was a good thing. The problem is, the problem is, that's so easy. That's so easy to distance yourself from those horrible Nazis or Mussolini or whatever. What has happened? And the context, let me just very summarize the context. We've got a context where national political authority is diminishing, where you've got um, the, the whole nation state in, uh, it, it has long been in, in disarray, but it is even more so as, as global capitalism spreads. And the reaction, as we saw with Trump and as we are seeing everywhere else is build walls, um, nativism, um, xenophobia, fake, or, or sort of creating new nativist myths and race theories, purity, and so on. So if with that context, what are, is happening in my country, I've been an immigrant there since 1972, is that we don't need that word anymore. We don't need to um, um, uh, get a re recoil from that because almost every tenet of fascistic theology has been absorbed into mainstream politics. So we don't need to be fascist because it's being done in more civilized language with more pretense of democracy. Um, every single thing. So let me quickly list what they, I, I was thinking. We, we must all agree, even I apparently must agree, that migration is a terrible thing. It's a danger, it's a menace, it destroys cohesion, it's full of rapists, and so on and so on. That nativism is a noble sentiment, except if you are a migrant, and then you are punished because you're not integrating enough. So if you're a white British person from Yorkshire, you can say, I'm a proud, Yorkshireman, I don't want my culture to change. But if a Muslim says, I'm a proud Muslim, I don't want my culture to change, I don't agree with either of them, that is a threat to national unity. That the white working classes, as if working classes were always white, they've racialized the working class in my country. So working classes were of all colors from the 1940s, now, we are only concerned about the white working classes, the forgotten people, the real victims of discrimination. That Brexit, we have to agree to all of this, okay? That Brexit had nothing to do with racism or anti-immigration hostility, even though Nig Nigel Farage stood in front of a poster with saying, and Turkey is coming into Britain, which was a lie that the will of the people, that is the populist will, must prevail. Democracy has thereby been weaponized, okay? By, by democracy being weaponized, I mean that now the dominant narrative in my country is the natives have spoken, they have decided, they hate immigration, they want their country back. Remember the slogan that won Brexit, I want my country back. From whom? From people like me. From people like you, actually, those horrible Europeans. Freedom of speech has also been weaponized. So that what was unsayable once upon a time, because everybody understood 
that everybody has a limit to freedom of speech, that in the public space, you didn't do some things in order, just because you hate somebody or you didn't say you're a very fat woman, I don't know you, go on a diet or get out of my way. You don't say that when you're on a bus next to a very fat woman. We know there are limits. That's all gone, that's all gone. Um, and that anti-racism is now special pleading, a trick, a plot, or unpatriotic. Now, this is modern day language but when you translate it to the, the um, Nazi Germany, you will find all of these theological principles. The problem for me is that those people who should be opposing it are either too afraid, too ambitious, so they're going with the flow, and I mean my fellow journalists, or kind of unable to see this new fascism. So that's my point. Thanks, Yasmin. Jean-Paul, how is Belgium, or you cover many countries through your uh, professional work? Sorry, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I would say that if I take the Francophone area, which is the area that I know more, and I would say that the word... Is it working? It's okay. No. Okay. If I'm sorry, uh, if, if, if I speak about the Francophone countries, I mean, which is the area that I know more, um, the word fascism, I mean, is not necessarily used that much. I mean, of course they are in France, for instance, a number of groups, French groups, I mean, quite small, they are really fascist in, in the old sense of the word. They are organizing even today. I mean, there, there have been a number of articles in Le Monde, in Le Soir, for instance, Le Soir is my paper, uh, on the organization of those fascist groups that really refer to fascism of the 30s. But when it comes to... Um, the Front National, the National Front, it has integrated a number of people that come from that background, but you cannot really say that it's a fascist organization. So what do we use? There has been a battle for many, many years in France for the right, legally, to use the word extreme droite, extreme right, which is a bit more, I mean, uh, not so pleasing as far right. Far right likes to look like geographical term, far from, whereas extreme, it's a, judgment of value about how extreme you are, which is not nice. And so there have been many, many uh, battles on, in court to be able to use the word, and now the word um, has been established as the key reference for the National Front, it's uh, l'extreme droite. And then uh, the question, of course, is that uh, personally, I think that, uh, for instance, when I was a journalist, I wrote an article for a French paper and asked me, can you just not use the word extreme right when you mention Le Pen, because you know we're going to be sued. I used it, of course. but. Uh, because I knew that I could win in court, uh, which is essential, of course. But for me, I mean, although the question is very interesting and important, semantics is part of the of journalism, is part of politics. At the same time, I, I would I would I would advise not to get lost too much into this battle. And that our role as journalists is perhaps less to qualify than to to say who they are, to describe them, to do our work, uh, to describe them, who who they are. Uh, who they associate with, and the Front National, National Front, for instance, associate with the FPE in Austria, which is clearly far right, associate with the Vlaams Bloc in my, Vlaams Bloc in my country, which is clearly far right, uh, who funds them, what kinds of theories they have. Uh, it, it is, I think we, we have to be careful not to be uh, sucked in, into a discussion which is too much focused on dis describing, qualifying. Let's go into the who uh, they are, what they do, what they want to do. I think this is the basic challenge for journalism today. Maybe one of the reasons, or, or the only reason I would be careful when using the, the term is, um, as some experts warned us, uh, not to insult the, the, the victims of genuine fascism from Second World War and, and before the Second World War. Which brings me to journalism and uh, what Open Democracy recently uh, uh, said uh, in, in their analysis of where the media are going right now. And they quoted uh, uh, essays Lippmann who, who wrote uh, between the two world wars, in an exact sense, the present crisis of Western democracy is a crisis of journalism. And then the open democracy says it's through nearly a century later. So where we are standing, how do media now 
discover what's happening and is journalism or media, because we will be talking about social media as well, part uh, of the problem. Bettina. Yes, um, I just wanted to add something that Jean Paul just said. Um, I think it's also important not to fall into the trap of um, picking up on fa um, the far right, um, uh, like the, the new rights, the, how they call themselves, because this is a self-definition, and I often read it in newspapers right now. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I'm going back to Austria, where uh, the right-wing uh, government is in place since 117 days, and the left has never been as strong as, as weak as now. Um, so the Green Party is not even in the parliament right now, um, for the first time since a very long time. And how was this possible? I think it's, of course, not the only reason, but uh, the tabloids in Austria are very, very strong. So to the left, you see um, the Kronenzeitung, the f formerly biggest uh, newspaper of the world in, in relation to the public. And, um, and to the right, you see um, Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, on the left, the young guy. <laughs> and to the right, uh, Vice Chancellor Heinz Christian Strache. Uh, so the Conservative and the Freedom Party are in the government right now together in a coalition. And uh, the tabloids are really big, th so those are very recent numbers, just a few days ago. Um, and the, uh, the first three numbers here are uh, tabloid papers and almost 50%, but those numbers are not as high as they usually are, so it dropped slightly. And um, the other ones are uh, quality newspapers, even though Korea could be in between. And uh, there in Austria, the, the media scene is very, very t dense. So um, there's a lot of closeness between politicians and, and journalists, um, especially between right-wing politicians and tabloids. And also the ads, um, you can see FPÖ, Freedom Party, paid the most of the ads before the elections. And you can see that uh, the critical reporting before elections really gets less. This is because of that. And um, one of the reasons, um, how could all this happen? I think media is a big part of it, not only in Austria. There has been a normalization of the far right, so you can compare the time cover 2000 and time cover uh, 2016 and make your own opinion. So it was uh, a kind of a shock picture almost, uh, or demonizing, and yeah. now the victory. And um, I also think that social media plays a big role nowadays. nowadays. So you see Heinz Christian Strache, he has 800,000 followers on Facebook. And um, this is almost three times as much as our biggest newspapers have followers on Facebook. And it's 10% of the voting population. So he can just talk to them directly and, for example, say, um, like he said here, there's a place where lies become news, and this is the public broadcaster. This is the news anchor, Austria's most prominent news anchor. And luckily, he had to pay 10,000 euros um, um, as a sue and issue a public apology. But as we know, uh, lies often stick, especially when they're shared as much. So Hans Christian Strache um, posts fi 15 days in average on, on Facebook and it's shared 400 times, usually. Thank you. Many studies show that if we talk about hate speech, for instance, that there is much less hate speech on conventional legacy media, in conventional legacy media, than on, on social media. Can you, Bettina, compare, because you analyze tabloids and social media? Um. Yeah, I mean, in Austria, I can talk about the Austrian case. Here it's often a synergy. synergy. So um, there is a lot of right-wing uh, internet platforms, and Hans Christian Strache retweets those sites. So it, it's, it's a way to talk to them directly, and of course the hate speech in, in, in the social media is, is even more, and it's kind of an effect that's, that's getting... Yeah, it is res like regulated and not even regulated by tabloids anymore. So. Yeah, I think it's, it's a bigger threat, and I, I used to have a very optimistic uh, view on, on social media because it's democratic, everybody can participate and, and have a voice, but with all the hate speech, I'm, I'm a bit concerned.
that you want. So yeah. in the Balkans, how popular social media are? Where is hate speech happening mainly? Hate speech is happening everywhere in the Balkans. Uh, the Balkan countries are characterized by, um, uh, let's call it, firmly consolidated, unconsolidated democracies. And uh, uh, media, especially traditional media, are strategic pillars of these unconsolidated democracies. Uh, so everywhere in all these Balkan countries, uh, the uh, government manages to control most of the media and control the whole public sphere. Uh, independent media, meaning critical media, are uh, very weak with uh, low audience, uh, on the edge of survival. Uh, so uh, talking about uh, uh, being part of the problem or part of the solution, the media are much more uh, the part of the problem. This government control media will l legitimize everything those governments do, uh, uh, favoring their um, populist cause that finally here is some elite, some political force that will uh, at last uh, enable the people, the masses, uh, to come to power. And they are fighting against any pluralism, especially political pluralism. So the media are taking a very bad role in uh, uh, destroying any political alternative. And in that sense, it is a very dangerous situation. The social media right now at this moment are the only really free part of the public sphere and even there, their um, uh, actions are limited because the ruling parties organize these armies of bots, of trolls, uh, which interfere in this free public discussion. And don't forget that the wars in the Balkans started first in the media. So, Yasmin, BBC is known worldwide as one of the best public media services. And we all know that one of the roles of public media is to be inclusive, to reflect diversity of a society. You've been quite critical of, of BBC, though you'll, you also love it. I love the BBC. I would die for the BBC, but I would also say that today it is not in a good place. And it refers back to what I said earlier. When journalism, for all kinds of reasons, rolls over instead of standing. The whole of the BBC was created with a mission by Lord Reith after the war. It was to defend liberal values. A few years ago, I was chairing something at the BBC, an internal conference, and somebody called Peter Horrocks who was then supposed to be the next leader, thank God he wasn't, but he did his damage. He said to me, to my face, the liberal age is over, get over it. And that was the year Peter Horrocks and his team decided that the extreme right, the British National Party, would be invited onto our most important political television program, Question Time. It was a dam breaking, okay? And they thought they were being really clever, that if these people come on and they expose themselves, then the intelligent public will know what they're really like. Well, on that occasion, it did happen, but because one of the other panelists, were well, two of the panelists, were women of color who brought him down. But since then, the access of those people, Nigel Farage, right, who hasn't got a single, didn't have a single member of parliament, was on question time 32 times in the last three years, 32 times. And, and so the B and, and what's happened with the BBC is they follow the most extreme social media, the bloggers and the tweeters. It appears in the agenda morning uh, news shows and then it, and, and somebody's just done a very good analysis of how they covered Brexit, for example. They were so scared of the right wing, 
because, of course, BBC depends on the government. We have a right-wing government in charge. That they absolutely failed to fairly treat my side, which was the Remain in the EU side. It was so, all this research is showing, they were totally biased towards Brexit. So, at the moment, we are fighting the BBC. But the good news is this, there is some good news. 90% of our press is on the right. 95% of the broadcast uh, channels, except for Channel 4, some parts of the BBC. Incidentally, five top BBC white men have joined the Conservative Party in the last three years, which shows where the politics has gone. The good news is everybody maligned Jeremy Corbyn of the Labour Party, right? Man of the left, always been of the left. And I'm not his groupie, I'm not his big fan. But somehow, they managed, they are managing to pick up the young voters. They are resisting this, this, this terrible place we're being dragged into. And it just shows that the power of conviction, they refuse to be beaten by the right wing. They have held and they're using social media in a very effective way. So there is hope for the liberal left if Jeremy Corbyn, who is so hated, now they're accusing him of anti-Semitism. I have known Jeremy Corbyn for 50 years, okay? That man is not an anti-Semite. But, of course, now, that new um, campaign is trying to stain him. But it's, a, it's an interesting, positive moment, I think. Before, uh, Jean-Paul, just one question, uh, Yasmin. Um, we have right-wing people in, in Britain, and they are often in the media, but they have to apparently be heard as much yeah. as the others. But is it the same just giving a platform to Farage or, 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 or Le Pen, Madame Le Pen, or we are supposed as journalists to challenge them? You, well, you have to challenge them properly. Mm -hmm. and How? I, I, I think by, you know, A, you have to decide if we had been journalists in the 30s, would we present Hitler and say he has the right to free speech? And if the answer is yes, then I'm sorry. You know, go wash your hand, face in shame. Because if people hadn't stood out and against that, I have many friends on the right, but they are part of the, the kind of right liberal constituency, if you like. We're talking now about people like Farage, who are not part of that liberal right spectrum. I have no problems with conservatives. You know, decent conservatives like Ken Clark and others are actually holding up our values better than some of the journalists on the left who've just surrendered. Farage is the person who... I hate him. <laughs> who set up UK, UK party, who is still a member of the European Parliament, receiving a salary there, and he will receive the pension, and he's been the, the main force behind Brexit. Jean-Paul, was the journalist the same in 70s, and mm -hmm. now the way they deal with these issues? Right, this is a privilege of old, old age, is to be able to compare. Uh, yes. <laughs> In, in, in the 70s, I, I, I bumped into the, the far right a couple of times as a journalist, and it was quite easy to cover because there was, it was in, in the context of the Cold War, and you had a number of far right, violent far right organizations in, in Italy, in France, in a number of countries, uh, in, in Latin America. I covered Latin America and death squads. So it, they were really far right. But uh, there are a number of um, factors that are interesting uh, to, to remember. First of all, at, at the time, uh, there was a clear separation between the conservatives uh, and, and the far right. There was just no continuum yeah. between the gaullist in France, for instance, and the far right. There was no, no mixity possible. Um, the press at the time was very powerful. It was very influential. Even sometimes you, have a monop you had a monopoly. I don't, I don't regret <laughs> pluralism in in, in television, but in France, so they had a strong monopoly and, and access to, to, to public service television, which was like the big church, I mean, for, in terms of media attention, uh, was not uh, possible for the far right. Uh, and then uh, we, there was also the, the idea at the time that liberal democracy was really the winning uh, movement. It was close to what 
Fukuyama would call the end of history. And so we believe that those organizations was, were, were, were really uh, on the fringe. And um, the far right had no real capacity to uh, use the media because there, was there were no social media at the time and there were very few media in the hands of the far right. So it was a completely different relation of power. If you take today and decade, a decade ago or, or 15 years ago, I mean slowly you had the appearance, first of all, you still had the far right, the violent far right is, is there. But then you had the appearance of those uh, parties that sometimes refused to be called extreme right or far right, as I said, called themselves either patriotic or we call them usually national populists, for instance, like the National Front or other organizations. Uh, and then you have also uh, on, on the right of the mainstream conservative parties, you have people that are very much attracted uh, to the discourse of the national populist. I mean, uh, I just saw that today uh, a minister of the CSU, the Christian Democrats from Bavaria, uh, basically uh, applauding the victory of Orban, for instance, whereas Angela Merkel of CDU, uh, Christian Democracy, uh, was not so, so sympathetic to, to the victory of Orban and just made service minimum, as we say in French, they said, okay, I, I congratulate any winner. Uh, but you have definitely today a continuum between the right wing of the mainstream democratic parties, conservative democratic parties, the national populists and the far right. That, that's, uh, that's an issue. A second, a second point that I see is that the, 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 media, the media system has changed completely. When I was working as a journalist and sometimes covering the far right in the 70s, my newspaper, Le Soir, had 200,000 copies every day. Today we have 60,000 copies. It's part of the crisis in legacy media, which explains to some extent we have less influence to, on, on the public debate. Uh, and then you have the appearance of the social media, which has provided everyone, but also the far right, also the left and progressive, if they want to, have provided them with a way to circumvent, anyway, the legacy media, especially the liberal media, and to talk directly to the people. There's what we call in France the fascosphere, the fascosphere, uh, which is quite powerful, I mean, it's very powerful. But also you have in the newsstands, the only magazines today that are progressing in their sales are, I would say, right-wing or even far-right magazines. I mean, they, they, so you can see there's, there's something happening. What is happening is that in the 70s, you have very few people voting for far-right uh, parties. Today, you have sometimes in some countries, 70% of the people are voting for parties that are hard conservatives to far right. And it changes completely parameters as a journalist because of course, uh, when I was a journalist uh, in the 70s, I could, uh, I knew that I had the support of everyone in the newsroom, in the public to fight the far right. Whereas today, the question, uh, the question is, in some media I really ask the question, is it a good economic model to publish and broadcast against a majority or a huge minority of the population. And so you have some people in the newsroom that say we should you know, be a bit softer on those organizations because they are part of our public, of a potential public. And so you have this, and then what's happening too, which was not the case in the 70s, in, in the 70s I had the feeling that, that we, the journalists, and I belong to a liberal newspaper, very much against the far right, but a moderate liberal newspaper, uh, but we were framing the message. When we were discussing questions like migration, we were the ones basically framing the way migration would be covered. Whereas today, on many of the most difficult issues, the most controversial issues, quite often I have the feeling that the far right or the hard right or the high concern, or whatever, the word against semantics, but the people that are uh, illiberals, I mean, are framing the issues on migration, on terrorism, on religion, uh, on, on a number of issues, and then uh, we don't have the capacity as journalists belonging to the legacy media that are in crisis in terms of resources. We are incredibly uh, sort of a victim of our own fragility. We, we know that we have a rate of popularity which is very low, and the far right has been, but also the far left, by the way, has been very strongly attacking uh, the establishment of mainstream media, and then now we, you have really a lack of credibility, a lack of trust, which is part of our own fault, I guess, but also part of these attacks, constant attacks uh, against the bourgeois press or liberal press, and it's an issue which, which, which means that uh, today the discourse, I feel, I fear, the discourse on many, on the most crucial issue determining the fate of our democracies 
it's much more in the hands of illiberal forces than in the hands of liberal forces. So in 40 years, everything has changed. There has been changing, the apple cart has been turned over. I feel very, sorry. If you can also tackle like what could be done yeah. for media to be part of a solution. Well, I think well, you're absolutely right that the, the discourse was taken over by the right wing on so many of these good values. We, we should have spoken up much more for the good values, for what Galbraith talks about, the good society, and, and not f kind of been afraid to say, actually, Racism is not acceptable. It's not an opinion. It's not a choice you can make, okay, a, a, a fight back. But there's also, there's a, there are other, Katie Hopkins, how many people here know about Katie Hopkins? Katie Hopkins is an evil woman, a totally evil woman, who suddenly came to prominence. Journalist. Well, she's not even a journalist. She's just a loud mouth uh, shocker of a woman. But she said all the unsayable things. Okay, she started off by saying, I don't let my children play with dirty working class children. Uh, and then she went to art and she became popular, populist. Asylum seekers are cockroaches. Um, uh, I would shoot those boat people who are trying to come into Europe. Why don't we send gunboats and shoot them? And every time she did that, she got a better and bigger job. More money, more money. But then something happened. She said, we need a final solution for Muslims, okay? And she fell. She's disappeared. So there was a line, and I think that was the, the I want to be optimistic. There is always a line, but the funding issue, I can't remember which, did you raise the fund, who is funding all of this? I don't know if you've ever read, and please do read this book if you haven't. It's called Dark Money by Jane Mayer, and we've now got a fantastic um, journalist in um, London called uh, Carol Caldwalder, who's been doing all the kind of bright um, um, stuff on Cambridge Analytica. But dark money tells you that there are billionaires in America who have been funding extreme right-wing activities for a long time. So with bright, they, they backed Farage, they backed UKIP, they backed Breitbart. Now we have a website in Britain, which is also their money. I don't know if you've looked at it, Westminster. It's the most horrible, horrible website. What it does is it tells people, our, all our politicians are corrupt. The political system, the liberal political system is a waste of time. Um, and it's very, becoming very powerful, or the Guido Fawkes website, which is again. So, but the response, I think, always, always should be twofold. Assertive, so my newspaper, I no longer work for I, International Business Times. Um, <coughs> they got rid of all their columnists, but I do work for I Newspaper. I Newspaper is a center newspaper for young people mainly. Our numbers are going up. Our sales are going up. The actual newspaper sales are going up because I think they have found a language and a way to communicate. Young people are the future. Who cares who reads the Telegraph? They will die. I will die. But it's the young, right? So there are some good stories. But the thing that is controversial that I say, in order for this, this not, these attacks on the right not to be so effective, we all, on the left, liberal, especially somebody of minority status like myself, I have a responsibility to tell the story of the bad stuff that's going on in my community. I don't want that hidden, because what gives the right ammunition is when people can <coughs> say, you see, there is all this going on, honor killings going on, female genital mutilation, and the traditional media is not telling you. So I tell those stories. I tell those stories in the most honest way. But I also say, hang on a minute, most rapists are white in my country, right? But there is a group of rapists who go around in gangs, and they are of Pakistani origin. My father was from what is now Pakistan. 
So I think we have to change and not protect, be too protective. Tell the stories in a fair way so the right can't tell you you're hiding stuff. So critical of safety. Yeah. Uh, what is the good news in the West Balkans that then in Austria? Um, there is not much good news from the Western Balkans. <laughs> I think the change will come with the change of this political regime, which doesn't look uh, 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 likely in the near future. Uh, another new threat uh, uh, is that the Balkans is now becoming again the battlefield between West and Russia. And uh, last time when it used to be that the battleground the population of uh, uh, Balkan countries profited from that uh, very nice position of Tito's Yugoslavia, which played between these two camps. Uh, people of Western Balkans would very eagerly uh, uh, embrace that, that new possibility, and I think our leaders are playing on, on, on that line. Uh, I would say that um, uh, not only from, from Balkan experience, but from my uh, academic insights, I would say that uh, uh, the problem is much bigger than just uh, racism and uh, uh, strength of the right. I would say that uh, these masses all over the world which uh, embraced populism and these new forces uh, as new parts of the political scene uh, were betrayed by uh, existing political parties. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of new things in, in, in global capitalism and uh, a lot of uh, people were victims of these new changes. In academia, there are, there are let's say, two approaches, two explanations uh, to these uh, new things. One is economic. A lot of people were impoverished. Uh, global, uh, globally, uh, social inequalities, economic inequalities are growing, and uh, uh, people now find themselves in a position that they cannot provide to their children the quality of life that they were provided by their parents. So this is one very, very strict explanation uh, which, says, which says we have to uh, politicize economic matters economy, econ e uh, policies of economy are not uh, uh, given a, a proper political representation and that's why they will accept any dem demagogic and opportunistic um, promise that things will go back. Another explanation is different and it talks about cultural change. Uh, people today in this uh, uh, world uh, which is savvy with uh, new technologies live in a different way. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't feel secure in this new uh, unstable work where financial capitalism produces profit in thin air, where young people, their children live in some clouds uh, on clouds with sci in some cyberspace that they cannot grasp. Everything that they knew, that they believed in, which was palpable, which was on earth, is gone. And they don't know, they, they, they just cannot find themselves in this new world. This uh, explanation will uh, look for a very different answer. We'll open the floor very soon. Uh, let's see what Bettina thinks is a solution or how media can contribute to a solution and then Jean-Paul has something to add and then we'll open the floor. Yeah, my hope is actually uh, journalism. So I think um, we heard before that we have to do less and we have to do, uh, we have to do more actually as journalists to nowadays, but we're less people and we have to do better journalism and it's, it's, it's hard. But um, I think the solution to this 
is cooperation. So I, I was at, at the Reuters Institute in Oxford uh, last fall and did studies on data journalism and there already cooperation is essential. So I think this is one, one uh, solution to this and, and also take the agenda setting back. Uh, studies say that 90% of the agenda setting is done by politicians. Yeah but uh, we should take that back in our hands and also tell the good news. So for example, the refugee crisis in Austria, crisis, uh, was actually managed incredibly well. So 22% of the people who came are integrated mm. in the workplace, but where is this news told? I, I don't see it. Um, and um, also I think journalism not, is not enough. We have to really go out um, to, and, and reach out to the people. Uh, go to the youth centers because this is also quite concerning that in Austria even the young people vote uh, right wing, different than, than in Germany. So really go out and reach out to them and connect people that usually wouldn't talk to each other. So I think that's the new role of our journalists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah just, just a remark, I mean, just one thing that, which is worrisome for uh, press freedom defenders, for instance, that are the fact that uh, the far right has been enabled to hijack free speech and to say, you know, we are the right, the real defender of free speech, whereas the liberals, they are to some extent reducing free speech to, politi to, to political correctness to some extent, hiding stuff. Uh, whereas the far right is using free speech argument basically to, to, to spill its uh, hate speech, basically. But we shouldn't, uh, we, we, we should be careful precisely of uh, respecting the rules that we have decided for ourselves. So for instance, when public television uh, has clearly rules that if you have parliamentary representation, you have access to funding for electoral campaigning, but also you have access to uh, the, the airwaves, and we should respect it. And so it's absolutely legitimate that Marine Le Pen is invited uh, by French public television. Uh, it, it might be irritating, but it's legitimate. It's defending liberalism. It's not defending the National Front. If we invite Marine Le Pen, we're defending liberal ideas. We don't defend National Front ideas. And by the way, I mean, the question at that moment is that how do you practice the challenging form of journalism that might help the people to understand who she is, for instance. But, you know, many journalists have failed because of their own characteristic as journalists. They didn't get it. That the key, perhaps, was knowledge. And the best adversarial journalist we have had in the his history of French television is Emmanuel Macron. During the debate, uh, he was able to show that Marine Le Pen didn't know her files well. She was confused. She, she confused the issues, and so he really demolished her to some extent as someone pretending to be the president of a big country like France. And so I guess it's a lesson for us journalists. Let's do our work. We should know. And know, just be provocative and ensure that we, we are macho in front of this person from the far right. We should know. Uh, just a final remark. I mean, public television, yes, they have to respect the rules. And pluralism, is a, as long as a political party is not prohibited, it has to have access to the, to the public airwaves. As a private newspaper, it's different. In Le Soir, for instance, we have had a clear policy towards the far right because the paper, uh, during the occupation years in the 40s, I mean, we had journalists that were shot, some 20 journalists and printers were shot by, by the Nazis because they had produced a clandestine version of the paper at the time. Uh, and so there was a long tradition of paper that we are very much against the far right. Uh, and so we decided that uh, we would cover the far right, I mean, honestly, because th they are part of the uh, of the society and, and the political offer, if I may say, but we will never give the far right the same privileges as other parties, no, ac no access to the forum page, for instance. No interview, which would be Q&A interview in a normal way. We had been criticized for being biased, uh, being not being impartial, it's not true. We just have an opinion, and, and a very strong opinion on the far right. We respect the standards of journalism, but when it comes to uh, those kinds of uh, forms of journalism, we, 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 we can definitely, we have the right, because of public, because of freedom of expression and diversity, we have the right to say, we are a committed uh, newspaper, and we decide the rules that we apply to ourselves. So it is th those kind of Complexities, I mean, the way we can address the far right, we have to discuss it more in journalism to make sure that we understand the best forms and, and the criteria and the parameters that we should use according to the media to which we belong. So prepare, 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 and challenge everyone. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for the time being. Let's, let's give this, this, uh, the, the, the floor to the audience. Um, do you have any comments, any questions? We are in Italy. 
We, according to the European Federation of Journalists, there are a lot of journalists here in Italy who are being threatened. Um, it's not only Western Balkans and Britain <laughs> which are experiencing. <laughs> and Austria. And Austria. <laughs> if there is a, I can, there is a question there. Hello, um, this one is for Yasmin, as obviously as a fellow Brit. Um, so I had to write some notes down while you were talking. Uh, safe to say, as a young, young people in Britain have become quite disillusioned with politics, they don't really feel like their voices get heard, and I think they're quite skeptical of media bias, um, which perhaps is a reason why a lot of legacy media circulation figures uh, continue to fall. Um, like you said, you work for the Eye, they give people um, of my age, of a left-wing uh, disposition, a voice, which is quite nice. Um, but my question kind of is, as a young British journalist, how should I approach working in a right-wing bias, traditional media, um, and challenge these far-right ideas without compromising my integrity um, as a young journalist <coughs> trying to make a name for themselves? Thank you. That's such a good question, because I think you've used the word I would have used, which is integrity. When I lost my column on The Independent, uh, which I'd been on for 18 years, one letter arrived when I was really devastated. I felt it was like the end of a marriage, and I was crying. Um, and the letter came from Paul Dacre, okay, who is the editor of the Daily Mail, probably as far away from me as I can possibly be and was on an old-fashioned typewriter, and he said, I bow to no one in my admiration of you as a journalist because you've had integrity. Now, that's quite important, right? That the man of the right, who has <coughs> more often than not, you know, made me feel so unwanted in this country. So it's the integrity and it's the strength. And when I got that award last year, what I said when I got the award was, my God, you never even invited me to this party before. You know, I'm 68 years old, and you've never invited me to your party. And look, you know, old, Muslim, feminist, lefty, all the unfashionable things. So it is integrity and it's strength. And there are always outlets. Even the Daily Mail will, will allow you to write, allow me to write, some quite left-wing things. Okay, if they think that I'm doing it properly and well. So I don't feel pessimistic and because the young, I mean, I find the young extraordinary, I have to say. I do find your, what you can do with the, you know, the internet and so on. So exactly, you've answered your own question. Do it, do it with integrity, with strength. Don't roll over. Don't think, don't tell yourself, oh, I'd better sound right-wing to get more money or respect or, you know, fail your own principles because that never pays off. And I have faith. I mean, the Corbynites are maligned, but I think they're showing us that it isn't over till it's over. I wish I was younger. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I was younger. I was young. Yes, please. Can we have a microphone there, here, please? Please stand up. And uh, hello, I'm Annette Novak. I'm a journalist and uh, have been editor for many years in Sweden, recently a commissioner for the Swedish government in media issues. Um, I would like to ask the panel a little bit about, because uh, one of the topics have been, of course, the media's role um, in fanning these um, uh, movements. And uh, we've touched upon it a little bit uh, on should we, how should we treat it? Um, and um, I would like to hear the panel's opinion both on the size of the actual activities, because for my country, it's extreme small percentage that actually abide to the fascist ideas. Now, they have managed to get into the general population through legacy media and how exactly the strategy of saying you are stifling our voices has made us go very far into almost only covering those voices in certain... Uh, Wait, what country? Sweden. Oh, okay. 
so could we reflect a little bit on that? I mean, the size of the actual, because they are very, very small, these movements, and how that has been uh, coming into general population, and, and also how the narratives that they spread have come into our languages. Sure, uh, I, I will be completely relevant to what you, you're asking, but uh, when, when it comes to the coverage of, um, of um, far-right organizations, uh, I think there are a number of issues that are at stake. I mean, uh, how do you deal with them? And, and one, I think, is going back to the basics of journalism, because we, we are today, as journalists, we are, just, we, we are part uh, of a bigger, more complex system uh, that would be required to fight back against uh, extremism in our societies, and so we're just part of it. But we're less powerful than we used to, uh, so we, we shouldn't expect too much from us today, I, I, I fear. Uh, but, um, you know, there's one thing that can be done, and sometimes can be quite effective, is investigative journalism, for instance, uh, exposing uh, the links between uh, the far right and uh, other elements in society that are not so so patriotic, for instance, is something which is interesting. When you, when you expose the links between the National Front and Russia, for instance, it doesn't go into the message of patriotic, uh, as a French, uh, I would say. Uh, if you, if you uh, recently, for instance, there was a very interesting investigation by Mediapart, which is a left-wing uh, online uh, uh, paper, I mean, which uh, published a story about how the intelligence services in France uh, were concerned about the fact that a number of military and policemen, retired or not, were joining the far right. Uh, it was fabulous for two reasons. First of all, it exposed uh, the interconnection between uh, institutions of the country and the far right, which the, far, the furthest to the far right, people that are really against uh, against the, the establishment, I mean, the, the, against society. But it shows also that they were uh, patriotic, I would say, uh, cops and, and intelligence officials that were really concerned about the infiltration of the far right into the institutions, which was to some extent a relief to, to know that. I think that as journalists, that are, you know, we, we, can, we should speak hours to try to, 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 to discuss it, but I think that uh, we have to go back to our own, uh, our own job, I mean, to do our work. Uh, as you mentioned, we have to be uh, the best reference when it comes to analyzing uh, those, those, those organizations. We should be able to be uh, covering the inconvenient truths that, that's yeah. uh, in our own community uh, and not just, not just be defensive all the time, trying to protect communities, for instance, that are the targets of the far right. No, we should just do our job and make sure that if there is uh, something wrong, it should be reported fairly, honestly, respecting the standards. Uh, so that's, that's a big issue. Integrity, again, is, 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 is certainly something. But then, just an idea, but also what we have seen in the last uh, years, and in the gap between the 70s and more recently, I jumped over two decades, and I think really, as a journalist, especially in liberal mainstream media, we tended to forget part of the population. We were focused much more on, the, on our own people, our tribe of educated, more or less privileged, cosmopolitan, uh, people and we forgot and, and we tended to be very attentive to the migrants for instance and how they would integrate into a society whatever and we forgot a part of the population these, these are the flyover states that as, as we mentioned in the states the working class if you say uh, I think we, 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 we did uncover I mean in, in I, I read a survey a couple of years ago that only when, when the, wor the, the working class, and I don't say white or not white, don't care, uh, the working class represented 22% of the population, they had 0.5% of the coverage in the media. I think it was a major mistake because one of the major lessons of journalism of, in the public interest, like the Hutchins Commission said 71 years ago, is to present every day a representative reflection of all the components of society. We failed. We did not talk about those people that today have been voting for the far right. The, far right. the National Front has been for many, many years the first working class party in France. Uh, the, the, so it, 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 it challenges as journalists. So good journalism solution, though there will be always those who are part of the problem. Uh, we, should we move to the audience? Uh, but audience here and audience 
of the co consumers of the media. Um, there is a gentleman there, they're here, they're there. Oh my, okay, four. Sorry? No, <laughs> oh, no, really? No, 45 minutes, uh, 5.45. It's 5.38 now. Um, uh, one of you said a very good thing about that um, an independent media in most countries is uh, under a very strict control. And uh, I have a question. What should representative of such media do being under such strict control? For, for example, living in one of the countries. Can we hear more questions and then we'll go on? Uh, yes, please, and then this gentleman and then this, and then they will kick us um, out. I'm used by a Turkish journalist. Um, you know, in the run-up to the Hungarian elections, I think it was a national broadcaster, uh, it, you know, footage from the rally, three ladies ask, being asked, why are you so happy with you know, or Orban? And it was like, yes, of course, because we don't have any, any wild immigrant animals running about in the streets, etc. So this was a striking example of how we, we, that we entered a new epoch now, as, the, you know, as used by Karl Marx. It's a new epoch. And uh, it also um, tells us that, you know, quoting Hannah Arendt and Wilhelm Reich, I think you should not be forgotten that there's an appetite of the of the masses for fascist order. And uh, this appetite is maybe unstoppable. I'm not sure, I'm a pessimist. Um, and the question is, we have a new second wave now, Orban, Kaczynski, you know, uh, copy pasting Erdogan and Putin, um, using these masses appetite and desire for fascist order to gobble up more and more and more as Brussels watches it. Yeah. And the question is, and also, I'm sure there will be more applications from Hungary, Poland, to European Court of Human Rights in the coming months and you know, years. And all these institutions, like European Court of Human Rights, are co collapsing because they are losing credibility and effect. So the question is, do you think the Euro European Union should have a response to these rising ra you know, wave of uh, authoritarianism opening in their faces or not? What should in independent media do? What, how should the European Union react? There is a, a question here, and we can continue. It's a very sunny weather. <laughs> Sit around the fountain. Uh, yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the floor. Uh, my question is for every member of the board, and it's uh, uh, particularly about the hate speech and how the far right movement in the, the USA presidential election manages to hijack this term to basically justify uh, hate speech under the guise of the freedom of speech. Uh, what should we, we, we do, and even if something uh, is even able to be done to stop this uh, kind of uh, hate speech? Thank and you. And the last one, and then I'll suggest that you do it as a final remark so that we can finish on time. Uh, thank you for the floor. My question is also tied to the American uh, elections. Uh, there's been a, um, a fascist parties in Italy and in the U.S. have reclaimed the, the fascist word. They, they, have, they take it with honor, the, the fact that they claim to be fascist. They, they call back to an ancient root of uh, Aryan pride. How does the left and n defend them it itself from from these people when they take it with honor and they're not ashamed of the of these opinions uh, and how does somebody fight against this in a democratic way when when they take it with such honor the violence and uh, the hate thank you for qu questions and comments can we have short twitter size final remarks and re re response to these questions Shall we start with you, Jean? No, two quick remarks. Uh, first of all, journalism is not about neutrality. I mean, all the heroes in journalism in the last uh, century, I mean, have been people that are, they, they were committed. The prizes in journalism today go under the names of uh, George Polk, who was a uh, very much committed uh, a, a journalist. I mean, goes to, in France, for instance, Albert Londres, the most famous prize in, in journalism, someone who fought 
against uh, uh, prison conditions. He fought for Jewish uh, people in, in Central Europe. So commitment, when it comes to defend uh, liberal democracy, I think is not uh, betraying journalism because there's a tendency some, on some part of journalism to say, we should be fair, we should be impartial, which is a cover very often to say we should cater to uh, what, what the far right is saying today. And finally, I mean, uh, if you're interested in the media and hate speech, there is a, pro a project that just uh, folded a couple of weeks ago, and Militsa was there. Uh, it's, it's called Media Against Hate, and it's a, it's, it's a coalition of organizations, of journalists, of NGOs, that have been working for two years precisely on the question of hate speech and how to uh, fight hate speech without weakening freedom of expression. Because if there is something that, that should not be done, it's give the far right the privilege of being the one defending freedom of expression. We are the ones defending, supposed to be defending it. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Yeah. See, I'm not a freedom of expression um, absolutist. I think there's always limits. It, the only question is where the line is. So when Charlie Hebdo, and this is in no way a defense of the murders and, that were committed by the, the, the terrorists, when they have a cartoon of that young Kurdish boy who died on the beach, and they say, what if he had grown up, he would, might have been a rapist? I'm sorry, that's not freedom of speech, that's hate speech. And I think we have to be very clear. But when it comes to, I think we need, the West has been very arrogant that civil societies were something we went out and built in Africa and East and they didn't understand it. We now need to get civil society rebuilding cohesion, trust, uh, uh, you know, coming together in our countries. We need Soros to be funding civil society projects in the West. <clears throat> what independent media should do, I think they should survive. That's their only task, because without independent media, we would really go into, into pure fascism. Uh, in Serbia, in Balkan countries, we have a long history of this very difficult survival of independent media, and it sometimes it, it survives only basing on enthusiasm, but it still is there. So I hope that it will continue to, to, to survive. Uh, concerning this, this uh, comment that there is something, um, uh, some eternal, strive in people for fascism. Uh, Umberto Eco was, uh, uh, wrote this famous uh, uh, essay about eternal fascism, but uh, uh, even he explained that although it ex exists and you can follow that through human history, you have to put that into context and see why people want this strong leader, this yeah. security, this uh, lack of uncertainty, uh, uh, not responsibility from my part. So these are the, the models of living that you learn through your life. There is nothing in human nature that uh, uh, favors you uh, to, to like fascism, but there is a need for security, for trust, for solidarity that every uh, 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 a human being have, has. And we, we, we have to, to see why people uh, find uh, solutions in populist leaders who uh, give them false promises. We have to understand to be in their shoes and see how they perceive that and why. Maybe just one, one last uh, sentence. Uh, okay. People ask for a strong leader when they're afraid, and I think the role of the media is to take the fear out of society. Yeah.